tell you a little bit about the New Economic Development Corporation and, uh, and a little bit about my background in terms of, of city activities and collaborative activities and so forth that uh, might enlighten you a little bit in terms of, of what I recommend you do in terms of collaborating with each other. But uh, I want to make sure that I have time for questions and, uh, and make sure that I'm able to address those things that are on all of your minds. First of all, we became a corporation, of course, last year. We, we started the corporation with four basic principles that I like to share with everybody, uh, four basic uh, things that, that inured to our benefit. But the fourth of which was the fact that we became a corporation. Uh, and I think that got all the headlines, of course, but there were three things that were more important. The third is that we, we jettisoned all of the regulatory activities at Commerce. We no, no longer have to worry about, about the uh, underground storage tanks or about, about uh, 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 carnival ride breaking. Uh, and, and uh, for instance, I come from a city that, that houses Bay Beach uh, with a new uh, zip and pippin over there. Get over and see it. Uh, so we, we became 100% focused on economic development. The, the second thing that was important is we reorganized. And we were able to, to get to uh, where we were able, to, we have divisions at Commerce or at the EEC that Commerce never had. Those things are entrepreneurship and innovation, business and industry, international, and marketing. I'll talk a little bit about each of those. But the most important thing that happened to us a year ago is that not only did we have a governor who balanced his budget, who eliminated a structural deficit of about $3.6 billion, but he also saw fit to invest in economic development. So we have a more competitive budget when you compare us to all of our Midwestern neighbors in particular. Still not as much as most, but far better than what the old Commerce Department had. Commerce used to be a dumping ground for for activities and also a, a, a place where when there were cuts to be made, let's take it out of commerce. Uh, that is no longer the case under Governor Walker. So let me get back to the, the basic divisions. We now have an opportunity to deal far, far better with small business and uh, entrepreneurs and would-be entrepreneurs through our entrepreneurship and innovation division. We do uh, everything from assisting with uh, incubators and accelerators to linking people up to venture capital or angel and seed investment. And I'm very much looking forward to this next legislative session because I do believe we're going to be able to come up with a venture capital bill that, that puts us on footing to uh, move in that direction. Business and industry is going to allow us to do far more in terms of targeted industries or clusters as you know them. We've invested $750,000 in the Water Council in Milwaukee, uh, that's an area, an example, or a prototype of what we hope to do in business and industry. It allows us to accelerate the uh, incubation of, of all things water related, whether it be uh, metering or desalination or filtration. Uh, all of those things are unique to Wisconsin because our gold mine in Wisconsin is Lake Michigan, and, and as well as Lake Superior. And so we're trying to invest in what we, in the resources that we have. Agriculture is going to be important. Defense industry is going to be very important. Biotech, uh, some degree of, of uh, advanced manufacturing. All of those things are going to be very important as we, as we continue to invest in, in sectors. The, the third area, as I said, is international. We're doing a far more robust global uh, relationship uh, through our international division. Prior to this year, we had offices in China, Mexico, Canada, and Brazil. <coughs> Today, we've got networks, but we will have networks in those four areas, but also Europe, Middle East, South Africa, India, and Russia. So think about that. I mean, until this year, we had no presence in Europe. We had no presence in Dubai. We had no presence anywhere in Africa, India. Uh, we've, we've taken Missions and, and our missions, by the way, are business to business, and I govern government to government, like you've seen in the past. We bring businesses together, and we have contacts ready for them to meet with, so that uh, they're going over to, for instance, India just recently, a trip that 
that was uh, that highlighted water. And there are, there are uh, companies who are ready to invest, ready to buy our products, and they meet with the people that, that go on those missions. I'm hoping that we have one this coming year with uh, that the first time that the governor will go on a mission uh, to China because we have an awful lot of activities going on uh, with that country and particularly now with water technology in the Anhui province trying to clean up one of the biggest lakes in the world. We also have uh, foreign direct investment opportunities with them. Uh, they've, through, through a company called PE, uh, has offered to put $100 million into the state of Wisconsin in the area of, of uh, new technologies, uh, medical devices, uh, some degree of, of uh, advanced manufacturing as well, farm equipment, that sort of thing. <coughs> so we've identified 50 companies. We're going to compare that down to 25, put those companies in front of those, those uh, investors in September, and each of them will, will be eligible for somewhere between two and $15 million of venture capital or, any, or seed investment. We also have an opportunity with China to do parallel funds where, where we may have to invest, or we may, may set up a fund in Wisconsin with US dollars and a fund in China with renminbi that allows us to, uh, or allows China to invest in companies here and then expand those uh, company's footprint in China by uh, using the, the yuan rather than the U.S. dollar. And there will be significant advantages to that. So the, the global opportunities are extraordinary, and because of that, we are very legitimately expecting to double Wisconsin's exports by 2015. In 2010, we were at about 18 billion plus. We expect to be at 39 billion by 2015, or for the, the numbers that are reported for 2015. And, and, and if you look at how is it that we go about getting uh, more jobs, it's going to be through marketing Wisconsin better, and it's going to be through that global activity, as well as creating new companies. So you can, you can understand why we're doing these three new things. The entrepreneurship innovation allows us to create more companies. The international activity allows us to, to expand our exports and bring more foreign direct, direct investment in. And then the third thing, of course, as I said, uh, marketing Wisconsin better, and that's why we created the marketing division, which is going to enable us to do more in terms of telling the Wisconsin story. When I say the Wisconsin story, what I'm talking about basically is is what you see when you watch a Badger game uh, or any any NCAA game, not a Penn State game, but uh, a, 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 a Division One game where at, at halftime each of those schools, it's an opportunity to tell its story uh, of who graduated from our college. I went to Northwestern, so I'm very proud of our, our graduates. Uh, but they also tell the story about the, the products we have uh, been researching or the innovation we've been involved in. We want to tell a story in Wisconsin that gets us beyond that default image that we have here, uh, which comes from Monday Night Football. Uh, obviously, coming from Green Bay, I'm, I'm thrilled to, to have the world know Wisconsin because of Green Bay or because of the Packers. But we've got to do more than tell that, uh, or, or that, that let the world think that we're just a bunch of people who wear cheese on our heads and like to eat brats, drink beer, and get our clothes off in cold weather. So <laughs> as we go forward, we are going to highlight several companies, probably half a dozen companies, including people like Rocco International, Harley Davidson, Trek Bikes, Cray Computers, Organic value, uh, all of those, and of course we want to include the Packers, the Brewers, uh, the Badgers, things like that. But we want to, we want to get that message out to site selectors so that we're on their radar screen. We want to get that message out to uh, the magazines that that have as their basic mission telling the story about business climates throughout the the nation. And of course, we've already started that climb uh, through the, the efforts of Governor Walker. In CEO Magazine, for instance, going from 41st in business perception to uh, 20th in two years, the largest jump in the history of that magazine. And CNBC just recently showed that we're up to 17th in their poll uh, of business executives. We were 37th just a couple of years ago. We're in the bottom, we started in the bottom of 10 in just about everything. Kaufman Index is another example in terms of entrepreneurial behavior 
we were we were so low that we weren't even on the chart at one time. I think Puerto Rico was ahead of us. So uh, we've gone from 49th or 50th or 51st there to 40th in one year. And obviously, we still have a long way to go. We want to get from the bottom quintile to the top quintile uh, by 2015. And so that reorganization is what drives the new WEDC. All of those things, I think, make us more responsive. The extended enterprise that is so important to us. And by the way, let me share with you the four basic principles in addition to an extended enterprise. Uh, that drive us. We want to be bold, we want to engage business, we want to be more accountable and transparent, and of course we want to act as an extended enterprise. And that means cities are a part of what we do, county corporations, economic development corporations are a big part of what we do, the chambers of commerce, the regional economic development authorities, and plan commissions, all a part of that extended enterprise, and are, are all represented by people we don't have to pay. So. Uh, my background, of course, lends itself to including them in our strategic plan. We want to make sure that you're served effectively by the city, by the county, by the chamber, and by the EDO. And, and that means Deb Clement, Clements, for instance, who serves the Wausau area, is absolutely critical to that effort, and the folks at Synergy. We want to act as an extended enterprise, too, to make sure that you're collaborating effectively, and that, and that we're not seeing an economy that simply involves rearranging the deck chairs. Nothing frustrated me more as mayor of Green Bay than to see, first of all, that a company move from Green Bay over to De Pere or Schwabenau. That was insult enough. But then to see that the state was providing incentives for them to build new infrastructure that heretofore they didn't have uh, and, and uh, create jobs that would have been created had they stayed in Green Bay. Made no sense whatsoever. So what we need to get to is a situation where everybody in the county is collaborating on that kind of economic investment, whether it's jobs or capital investment. And that means uh, talking to your neighbors, first of all, about uh, what's fair game. Uh, if, if economic development folks in a village are bragging about the fact that they stole something from Wausau, None of, none of us are accomplishing anything. What we did in Brown County was, was adopt a non-compete resolution. And that resolution said nothing more than that if, if someone is going to uh, consider leaving a community, if a company is, is thinking about leaving, and they search out the suburb and ask, what can you do for us if we leave the central community? That suburb, have, suburb has a commitment and an obligation to all of the communities in that county, to go back to the host community and say, did you know that this company was thinking about leaving? And now that you know, you have an opportunity to, to reach out to them, provide your own incentives and do everything you can to retain them before they consider our incentives. And we have an obligation to refrain from negotiating with that business until we know that they're leaving no matter what. Then everything is, is fair game again. That, that non-compete clause was adopted by probably 16 communities, I believe, in Brown County. And I can assure you it's been violated a couple of times, but not anywhere near the kind of chaos that we had prior to 2005. So uh, that is very important. The other thing that I, that I would encourage you to do is follow, better follow what you have in terms of your TIF agreements. Every, tax incremental finance deal has a specific project where there's a pledge to retired debt, public debt that was related to that project. And when that project is completed and the debt on that infrastructure is retired, there is an obligation to close that tip. Your city council, your county boards, your school districts and technical college very, very seldom, I would, I would even go so far as to say never, is a party to the consideration of that TIF being extended up to 23 years. And when those TIFs are, are extended, what it means is that city is now spending money, or that village is now spending money on things that were not a part of the original intent. 
And therefore, they're taking money that could now go back into the school district coffers, back into the technical college coffers, coffers or back into the county coffers. And, and, and there are times when they're extended, those tips are extended for very legitimate purposes. And all I'm saying is if they're like legitimate, then get them into the public eye and have them explain why you need to extend the tip and what those legitimate purposes are uh, for, for uh, extending the tip. So I would, I would encourage you to, to guarantee that, first of all, your tip board is staffed effectively by the people who need to, to make those decisions, and then that you not allow the extension of those tips uh, unless there's a legitimate purpose that goes to the needs of, of uh, all four entities and not just the, the host community. Be happy to take questions about that or anything at, at the WEDC now. I want to make sure that I give you an opportunity to, to weigh in. Yes, ma'am. My understanding is, I mean, on this tip, you have to get joint review board approval yes, to extend the district. Okay. Yes, you do. I got the impression you thought you did. And my problem is, each each entity has one representative on that, and they're going to that board with what they think is the authority from the original obligation. And you need, to, you need to have someone on that board who is agreeing that I will not take a vote on that, on, on a TIF extension, unless I come back to my city council or my school district. That's not happening around the state. Mm. They're being, those things are being extended with the vote of just that small body. And I think there's, there's an extraordinary opportunity for um, mischief, let's say. Just a question. We had um, done some other things in the community. One of them was working with, uh, I believe it was, fire stations on the green. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, we, we created a group called the Ritter Forum, and it was it was set up by the St. Norbert College. We, uh, When I was thinking about leaving office, St. Norbert came to me and asked if I would convene the forum. I think they had uh, Governor Grafis had done it after he left office. So when I became chamber president, I said, well, let's now develop a contract with the, with the chamber, and uh, we, would, we would do an annual seminar. That, after doing two of those seminars, the Ritter, Mr. Ritter and the college came back to us and said, those are great, but we're really not influencing um, any sort of, of public activity. We want to tackle something big. So we set about looking at what represents big in terms of the river farm. And what, what we determined was big was, was fire department consolidation. We got all the chiefs together and their, and their administrators and mayors and said, is there any chance that we can start collaborating? We, over a period of about three to six months, got everybody to start purchasing through the city of Green Bay. And that meant whole turnout gear. Uh, got to the point where we were actually serious about about purchasing vehicles, the uh, town of Bellevue, village of Bellevue, and the city of Green Bay did joint contracts to purchase equipment or to, to purchase major vehicles and save probably fifty to one hundred thousand dollars. Now everybody's doing that, and so as we we uh, did more and more on the purchasing end, they started examining the response time around the county, and so we literally put maps up on the on the board. And we showed that that response time from from this station to uh, certain areas in the city and, and ultimately the county was four minutes if there were no boundaries <coughs> versus eight to ten minutes if you if you only allow that fire truck to go up to this point and no further. And so I and everyone started scratching their heads and realizing, well, you know, at the very least, we should start looking at how we define uh, our, or, or how we, we plan for new houses, new firehouses throughout the county. So Green Bay has to look at, we have seven yeah. uh, in Green Bay. So we had to look at it in terms of, okay, if there's gonna be an eighth fire station, should it be developed so that we can better serve the downtown, for instance, or is it, should it be uh, sited so that we can serve Bellevue, so, so we can serve the pier? Morality. And that's what they're now doing. And then the next step, and then in signed documents, the next step was to do what we called um, 
I uh, can't remember the specific phrase, constructive collaboration or, or uh, something to that effect where, where we would essentially get to where, where there would be a fire district, everybody would continue to have the same patch on their arms, the same label on their trucks, but it would all be supervised by one entity. And it would probably be an inter entity separate from the city of Green Bay. And obviously, as, a, as by far the largest fire department, it would be logical for Green Bay to keep what it had, but then add some support throughout the county. The Green, the Green Bay's department was probably two or three times the size of everything else combined. Uh, so, so the intent was to separate that from the city of Green Bay, call it an you know, independent district, and and then have everybody supported through their budget. That's what they're working on today. Uh, and I, I look forward to getting some follow-up from that. Uh, the, the next step that the Ritter Forum was going to take, uh, as I was leaving the chamber, was to get to revisit the whole issue of, of police consolidation. Because there was a study done in 2004 or 5 that showed that every community would benefit from consolidation. And as I told the group at dinner, uh, there is ir irrational behavior uh, at play there. One of the communities would have, would have enjoyed a $1 million savings from police consolidation. Another community would enjoy a $3 million savings. City of Green Bay would enjoy a $16 million savings. So because all the other communities were, were going to save less, and Green Bay was going to save more, they said, we don't want to do it. Well, think about the logic behind it. We don't want to save money because someone's going to save more. Uh, so obviously that was something that, that we wanted to revisit. And my, at the time, my response to that was, I'd rather go back into that process, for instance, if I was mayor, I'd rather go back into that process and say, I'll find a way for Green Bay to share some of its $16 million in savings if you all agree to come back to the table. And that's hopefully what it worth. In your fire study, did you include the people from ISO and the insurance industry on that to see how it's going to affect the ratings of the various communities then? That was, was a part of the discussion. Green Bay's ISO rating, I believe, is two. There are others that are probably four or five. Uh, so yes, it's a consideration. But, I mean, it wasn't considered when you were talking about the economics of uh, yes. corporate you know, purchasing. I mean, was it considered how it was going to affect the taxpayers? And he's outlining communities and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, and how is the taxpayer coming the out? The likelihood of, of the surrounding communities improving their ISO rate was very significant. So okay. they were they were from out mm -hmm. Quite frankly, plus and loss of community, and what you just talked about, we've been talking about for 30 years. Right? I mean, it's. Sure. And, and Green, Bay, Green Bay talked about it probably for 30, 30 years. years. Well, yeah. Beyond that. Um, couple of things. Um, number one, I understand your new agency is already going under reorganization, but whatever the case might be, well, you, you, the governor shook up some things according to... We hired one person. Okay, that's, well, whatever. that's the organization. Whatever. Um, I understand going back to what you said, and all I know is from what I read or see in the media or here, most of the funds so far, the majority of funds, if you as an agency of so far has been on retaining, retaining business. The, of the 37,000 jobs that we've created and retained, 23,000 are for, for retention and 14,000 for job creation. Yeah. Most of the money, okay, is, is, would that be a fair That's statement? Not necessarily, no, because the, numbers the job up. numbers are heavily in favor of retention, but the dollars that it takes to retain are nowhere near as much as the job that it takes to create. Okay, so the dollars you spent to create compared to last year is negative so far. Job creation according to the numbers in here. Um, for this past year. Uh, the I'm dollars that we the, the jobs created, you're saying you're spending more dollars to create jobs. Yeah. But according to this, the number of jobs created this year, new jobs created compared to last year is actually less. You've retained more jobs. No, I think, I think you're, you're misunderstanding well, the point. I, I, I got that, but, but another point, when you get into this, quite frankly, what we have to offer and what you were talking about, other states can offer, financially. 
most of them in. And most of them in, and probably some of them can exceed what we have. Absolutely. So when you're Excellent. talking about marketing Wisconsin, and I believe that, what does, when you, you can use whatever, you know, to market Wisconsin, what are you going to market Wisconsin? Better people, education. You should move fact, to what you should move to Wisconsin because we have these things. Because we can't, you know, we, quite frankly, we can get into a game that all these states play. If you don't do this, we're going to move. And you talked about communities, coals, for example. And you might not have put any money in coals, but they just move to a suburb. They're, they're, they're already in Menominee Falls. They're already in Menominee Falls. But their main expansion is going to be where? In Menominee Falls. Their main expansion. And who is paying for the extra infrastructure or whatever? Menominee um, Falls is a pretty falls. significant infrastructure. Right. Yeah. So we haven't really, you got went down to the point before. If that was in Milwaukee and your jobs were in Milwaukee, we haven't created really any more jobs. Coles is going to create about 3,500 jobs. That's right, and they could be in Milwaukee rather than someplace I, else. I would not have had any problem with that whatsoever. That's right. But we don't. We're not in the game of deciding where in Wisconsin that happened. As as but you Wisconsin. also just talked about the cooperation that you should have and how you're going to go that's, about getting. That's simply my my advice to all of you. <coughs> we don't we don't get involved. In that. How are you going to your advice? So. How are you going to work with the communities, whether it be WAS or anybody else, to get that property? Oh, are we going to work with them? Mm -hmm. What? Understand when, when there's a prospect for WEC, we immediately put out a, a message to our extended enterprise. And for instance, if, if a company is saying, I don't care where I am, I just want to be in Wisconsin, we'll let everybody know. Very seldom does that happen. They may say, I want to be somewhere in central Wisconsin. So we'll get a hold of, of Synergy, McDevco, whoever, and, uh, and, the, and sometimes the cities as well. And we'll say, here's, here's what they're looking for. So many square feet, so many acres, uh, rail potentially, and a variety of other specifications. Find us some sites, we'll get back to them with those sites. And, and then you are responsible within your county for providing incentives that are going to distinguish for that business where in that, in that county they want to be. We're responsible for bringing them to Wisconsin or, for instance, to Marathon County. That, that county then, uh, we get out of the way and that county then has to determine what sort of competition is going to be in play to determine whether it's going to go in Wausau or Rib Mountain or Schofield. Uh, obviously, it's not our burden to, to determine that. Paul, you indicated that in your consolidation you efforts. I'm sorry, what? I know you don't. Bill Nate. Bill, yes. Good to see you. Nice to see you again, Paul. You indicated in, in, that in your consolidation efforts in Green Bay that the, the townships and villages were being irrational. If that's the case here, what can the city of Wausau do? whether it's a carrot or a stick or intelligent uh, influence discussion to get them to be rational. I think it goes back to what I said earlier about if, you, if you've got if you've got a price tag on things, the city is never going to enjoy the benefit of that unless everybody comes along. And if, and if you literally have to take a piece of your savings and distribute it somehow, so that you're still enjoying rational and, and quality savings, and that everybody's getting a little more. That's one option. Uh, you know, if, if it's a situation where everybody's winning, but they don't think they're winning enough, enough, and would rather simply embrace the status quo, I don't know that you'll ever get beyond it, except by, by exposing publicly that irrational thought. And you either, you either uh, Convince the media that that this is uh, this is something that that is going to benefit everybody, and here's how, 
and, and, and for someone to make a decision that doesn't allow for that savings uh, is, uh, is irrational. Or you go back to, like I said, I mean, almost uh, sharing your wealth. And, and like I said, that's, that was the step that I was prepared to, to encourage the city of Green Bay to take before I left in 2011. Is that, I mean, if, it's, if there's truly three times the savings in Green Bay compared to everybody else, and, and you're not going to enjoy any of it if they don't come to the table, somehow you've got to find a way to share. And of course, the long term benefit to the city of Green Bay or Watson would be incredible. Absolutely. And, and you know, that sharing could be the first three years of the Green, first 10 years. Ultimately, everybody gets back to. to enjoying whatever it is the study show. Yes. Well, no, in, in the past few years, or has the corporation, is it moving along uh, as your goals and strategies have put? Are you satisfied with it? Um, are you revisiting some of those, some of those goals? Um, um, it seemed like a pretty good structure and a great idea a, when yeah, you put it you. together. It's a great structure. Uh, clearly compared to the Congress Department. I mean, we're way ahead of where the Congress Department was uh, in terms of response time, in terms of, of the resources uh, or tools that we have available to our extended enterprise and, and business. Obviously, we'd be foolish not to keep revisiting everything on a regular basis. We tweaked our strategic plan this year very little, however, uh, and we, that was adopted by the, the uh, Board of Directors last month. Uh, so we're, we're very satisfied with the structure that we have in place. We, uh, I think, will be going to the legislature in January uh, after talking to our board and to the governor about certain changes that we want in legislation. The main one being venture capital, because nothing even got voted on last year, much less passed. Uh, so uh, that's an initiative that we want to add to, to our resources. Obviously, uh, we're going to weigh in on other things like, like mining. Uh, we believe that there's an opportunity for the uh, legislature to better understand the balance between the environment and, and the economy. And therefore, uh, we're, we're very excited about seeing the, the study that's going to be coming out in, in September that will basically address that whole issue of, of uh, what will happen uh, as we start mining for taconite, and what will happen, hopefully it will also address the whole frac sand issue along with that. So we're, uh, we're going to be making recommendations about resources and about new legislation that will assist business. But our structure, I think, is, is fairly, uh, fairly in place. Um, but obviously, like I said, on an annual basis, you'll see two or three changes in a 100 person organization. You just used the word frac sand. Are you involved with the millions that are being spent on Highway 53 along the road there on the rail terminals? My question being, and the one on Highway 8, they're building the big one. My question being, is it felt by your corporation that frac sand is gonna be a business that's gonna be around for many, many years? We haven't been asked to, to weigh in on the future of frac sand. In other words, the, the governor and the legislature have to determine their commitment to frac sand mining. Yeah. If, they, if they'd say, we don't want anything to do with frac sand, we, then obviously if someone comes to us for assistance in that area, we don't do it. If, if they commit to long-term mining, uh, then the message to us is, if ever asked, we will provide assistance. They haven't been asked. Okay. So, I mean, there's millions spent and millions more under construction right now, north of Chippewa yeah. on 53 and on Highway right. 8. And yeah, I've been to, the, to those areas, and uh, and there's no question that that with everything going on in the Dakotas and elsewhere in the country, uh, there are opportunities uh, to expand jobs in that area. Well, there is, but having been in the energy field for 40 years. The last projection I read, half the drilling units in the United States that were, they're projecting half will be used in the fourth quarter of what we're using in the first quarter. Well, so it's already on a decline for directional, for boring and frac sanding as I see it. And that's my point. Yeah. We don't, 
we don't determine a strategy of okay. what business is okay. that, that is that's primary due to the current uh, natural gas and some of the natural gas costs well, right. at this point in time. Well, yeah, but, I mean, we have no more storage space for natural gas in this country. Yeah. And the liquid. But I'm just wondering, so so right now you aren't working on the strategy issue of what's going on in that quarter. Yeah. Okay. No, that's, why, that's why I, I, I said earlier, I, I'm looking forward just to having that address in the mining study along with Ackerman. But I, I don't know if it's going to be, but I'm hopeful. Thank you. On the 8th of July in the Milwaukee Journal of Settle, there was a fascinating article about the city of Milwaukee and Chicago trying to come together in this world economy for a lot of different reasons. Since in the past they've been adversaries stealing each other's business and it sounds based on the article, it's really a grassroots effort. And in fact, it sounded like they downplayed the state's emphasis on that. Just the one sentence. That's a good point. It says, first, let's agree with the OECD that anything left to state government to facilitate this won't happen. I just wonder what you think of this effort and what is your corporation's involvement with it, if any? Yeah, I, I personally have been involved. The, the two governors haven't come out and said, this is a great idea, let's bless it. So, so I think to the extent that the quote that you gave is fairly accurate because it's going to be difficult for the two governors and legislatures to say, let's sing Kumbaya together. Uh, the, the two regions are much more aggressive in working on this. And, and in fact, I'm having dinner next Wednesday, I believe, with, uh, with my counterparts in Indiana and Illinois to talk a little bit more about this. What I said in the forum at Marquette last week was that there are areas uh, re that represent low hanging fruit where there could be some very immediate collaboration. And water is a perfect example. Chicago has access to the same lake we do, uh, as does Northwest Indiana. So if we were to look at ways to collaborate on water technology and investment in desalination, purification, and so forth, uh, and bring business to all three states that uh, would serve that whole initiative, there is, is opportunity there. Likewise, education, particularly workforce training. Each, each state has workforce investment areas that, are, that receive federal funding, all from the same force, it's the same source. So for us to start looking at who has best practices in their state, uh, you know, something going on here, here in Wausau, for instance, could benefit Cook County by way of, of, of an idea. We want to make sure that that gets replicated. We want to make sure, too, that our technical colleges are all on the same, uh, same path with respect to serving an undereducated workforce and an unskilled workforce. In Wisconsin, for instance, we have 600,000 people without a high school diploma. And that's the, the area of our workforce that is so mismatched to the skills that we need and therefore guarantees that we'll, there will always be a certain percentage of unemployment. So if we, can, if we can get the technical colleges collaborating and communicating, we will accomplish something. And then taking advantage of, of those major universities, Marquette, UW Milwaukee, Parkside, and then in Illinois, Northwestern University of Chicago, Paul, et cetera. Uh, they all are doing research on areas that, that don't affect just their backyard, they affect the region and even the world. And so we need to take better advantage of the extraordinary educational institutions that we have. Will we get to where Governor Walker is going to say, hey, geez, Mayor Emanuel, we really don't need that business. You go ahead and pay. No, we're not going to get to that. Uh, and, and, and vice versa. Uh, but there are, there are areas where, where we clearly can, can collaborate, and I think that's what the leaders of that study are expecting in the future, and that's what we're going to be talking about next week. Thank you. What does your um, entrepreneurship and innovation unit do, or what do they offer? The entrepreneurship and innovation division uh, starts primarily with working with the various incubators that exist around the state. We have one called Advance in, in Green Bay that incubates about 33 businesses. We want to make sure that we're 
available to them for uh, assistance in accelerating those, those businesses, whether it be writing uh, business plans or helping them seek out venture capital or angel and seed investment or uh, providing grants for uh, some of their, their research or, um, or pre-investment strategy. So, we, and we've, we've invested in the uh, Veterans Transfer and, and Victory Spark, uh, it was just announced last week, both dedicated to providing grants to, to entrepreneurs who come out of the military. Uh, we, we are working with places like 94 Labs in Milwaukee to, to continue to expedite the kind of work that they're doing where they're, they're trying to create clients for the businesses that are being incubated rather than, than the emphasis that you see in most incubators where they're trying to create investors for those businesses. So it's a new strategy that, that is paying big dividends in Southeast Wisconsin, so we're investing in those kinds of <coughs> accelerated ones. And then as I said, the most important thing we're doing is trying to get the state to create more venture capital. And we're, we're a state that population-wise represents about 1.8% of the state of the, of the country's population. We have about 0.8% of the venture capital that's being employed around Wisconsin. So that's a very significant flaw for us. Back to the local issues of collaboration and cooperation. It seems like the state is always involved with the stick and the carrot and trying to accomplish things. Are there efforts to create grants and aids to, to areas that say work toward protective service consolidation as opposed to just having the local people try and do it? So you give them incentives or you take away an incentive if they don't? Yeah. Uh, I can only speak to that in terms of my past life. We're not directly involved in that sort of thing because it's, it's not a part of our purview. But I can tell you when I was president of the Alliance of Cities, one of the things that we strongly suggested to the, to the governor was instead of, of simply waiting for communities to collaborate on joint police, for instance, that you tell them that every county is going to have two police departments by a date certain, unless you collaborate. And, and then there, because of that deadline of five years, 10 years, whatever it is, people are going, to, are going to know that if they don't collaborate, the sheriff department is going to assume them, or the largest municipal police department is going to assume them. So we talked about things like uh, you know, guaranteeing that everybody gets to the table today and has a deadline for getting it done. And, the deadline, and, and, and your failure to, to achieve that deadline has some fairly significant consequences. The other thing we talked about was, was uh, for instance, this whole issue of double whammy. Uh, does everyone know what that basically is? It be basically, large cities pay for their police department and then have to pay for the sheriff's department as well without getting much in the way of services. And we can argue about that all night too, but one of the ways that we wanted to get around that was to show that if a central community had a border agreement with at least two of their neighbors on services or on taxation, they could opt out of paying for the sheriff's department. That was something they got very close to, to uh, being passed, I think probably the late 90s. It hasn't been revisited since then. So my point is there are, the League of Municipalities uh, is, is very active in coming up with those kinds of create, uh, creative ideas. And if you want to sign on to something like that, I'd encourage you to talk to Dan Thompson or whoever represents you in those areas. Yes, sir. You keep uh, talking about venture capital. I'm not very involved in that area. Um, you also, when you talk about the global economy, you made mention at that point in time that a lot of that has to come from the venture capital. Is that right. correct? Yeah. And from what I also understand, the legislature, which you said last session, did not deal with that issue. Right. So 
what you why are you encouraged that they're going to do that? Very good. Let me put it that way. Yeah, great question. Let me put it that way. That was a very rare situation, and I don't think I'm speaking out of turn when I say this, where it wasn't the Democrats against the Republicans. It was the Assembly disagreeing with the Senate. And the Senate, I believe, was very prepared to pass something uh, it, because we knew that there were Democrats who were ready to support a Republican initiative. The assembly had an entirely different view of venture capital. I don't know if you remember the whole dispute over what was called cap codes. Uh, a, a very bad idea, in my opinion. We're delighted that that didn't get approval. But uh, but I think we've gotten beyond that. I think the two houses are going to are going to agree that something has to be done. And I do believe that there's very significant bipartisan support to get something done. Uh, and we don't have to go back and revisit that whole cap code issue. We don't have to go back and, and revisit the dollar amount to a large extent. I think people are, you know, it started out at $500 million a dollar. I think everybody knows it's going to be somewhere between 100 and 200. And, uh, and I think we, uh, we've laid a lot of the groundwork for whether it's going to be, there's, there's a continuum of investment just by way of a primer on this issue, from angel investment or early stage all the way to uh, late stage venture capital, and, and it may mean five thousand dollars over here, all the way up ten million over here. So there's there's agreement on that whole continuum issue as well. So I'm encouraged because a lot of that political stuff is out of the way. Yes. One of the biggest sources for quote unquote investment capital, original equipment manufacturing. A good example of that is Exus Machine, the superior category recent and acquisition or partial acquisition, distribution rights like currently later on, potential acquisition. Are you in the position or do you see uh, any of the programs being developed to foster more and more original equipment manufacturers and then investing into uh, on a non-majority ownership in benefit technology? I think we will have, it won't necessarily directly deal with OEMs, but we'll have the ability to provide additional incentive for OEMs and others who see that there is incentive in them for them to put dollars into that kind of thing. I would tell you there's three things that have changed in the last two years of the Walker administration has come to be. One, the tort reform was a major issue that really changed the, the OEM's opinion about investing in the state of Wisconsin. Right. Secondly, the workforce here is conducive to the original equipment manufacturing mentality. Three, from the supply chain perspective, Particularly with the rail services that went out over the superior block west and shortened the, the delivery times of uh, product to China by two days to those rail systems has made Wisconsin a, a, a very interesting spot from a supply and world supply chain perspective, both from a parts perspective as well as a fleet perspective. And, and last but not least, MA people at OEMs are willing to typically invest. Well, under certain incentive scenarios, federal and state package kind of deal to put together to invest in on a minority basis on right. Wisconsin. And I think you'll see that, that that encouragement will be expanded a little bit. You know, Act 255, for instance, gives a 25% tax credit to, to uh, it'll people. It'll be used by a corporation. Yeah, about yeah and, my, that, and that's my point. Is we, want to, we want to take advantage of that same sort of concept and expand it so that corporations do see the absolute. I can't guarantee that, but, but the opportunity exists. It's to do that with me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, one, other, one other thing regarding economic development. One of the biggest problems with, with investors investing into small businesses is a federal problem and a Wisconsin problem called material participation. You have a high net worth individual that works in a company or works in, a, in their own business, they may get $100,000 investment in a startup company, as an example. They cannot take the losses of that particular company against their other income unless they meet material participation requirements, both federal and state of Wisconsin. That's a huge problem and a major reason why a lot of individuals, when you start looking at investing in, in certain options, will not make an investment in any startup of any kind unless there's an absolute clear-cut guarantee virtually not from writing, but real clear path to a three-year exit that they can actually see because they can't take any of that particular losses against their other income. 
eliminating that material participation requirement on technology-based investments, both federally and in the state of Wisconsin, would be a huge problem. And the other thing that currently is going on is the Wisconsin Department of Revenue is auditing. Excuse me? We'll correct that issue. Excuse me? Yeah, you said that's a big problem if we were to do that. It's a big problem. If we can eliminate it, it would just make a solution. I may have got to my next point I want to make. The state of Wisconsin currently is auditing old deals in which individuals have had losses or have tried to bring something to market and got wiped out for one reason or another in the recent recession. And they're not able to take the losses on their old investments. They're locked up. They're sitting in companies. They can't get that those losses. They can't take them off. And it's a big problem with those people ever wanting to make another investment and get any kind of income. I think that's a discussion we should have with the Secretary of Revenue, Rick Chandler. And I very much encourage you to come down to Madison and talk to us because I've written on the topic several times. Okay. I'll talk to Rick and I'll give you a card to make sure we follow up. Other questions? Real quick, again, just from what I read recently someplace where it said that your agency, WPDC, is projected to outstand the revenue for next year. Yeah, I have no idea how someone could have come to that conclusion. Okay, but. Absolutely fallacious. Yeah. Okay, so you're saying that's not true. But if it was what they said in there, it said, well, if that did, if it were true, the two alternatives would be either to increase the money from the taxpayers or to decrease the incentive. My own personal view, if it were true, I don't see how you could decrease the incentive. No. Let me explain that. It's very important for you to understand. You know, we had our budget adopted by a 13-person board of directors, which includes four legislators, two from each house and two from each party. And when the budget was adopted unanimously after explaining everything, and we showed that over two years we're going to have roughly a $5 million surplus. Someone looked at that same document and somehow concluded there was a $10 million deficit. I have no idea how. But the way we came up with a $5 million surplus, and the reason that we're very comfortable it's not going to be more than that, so I don't have to worry about your contingency, is that as we offer awards, let's say we give $100 million, it won't be that, near that much, but for round numbers, $100 million to 500 companies. Of those 500, probably as many as 100 of them will not claim those incentives. So when we say we're going to spend $100 million, we're basing that on every possible commitment we make, knowing full well that 100 of those companies probably aren't ever going to claim maybe $20 million of that 100. So the odds of us having a much bigger surplus than $5 million is huge. The odds of a deficit is almost nonexistent. Can you close with one more example of cooperation in the Green Bay metro area? Can I talk about the KI? Yeah. Did everyone here hear about the Resch Center and KI in Green Bay? I talked about it earlier. That was an area, and I use it to illustrate the fact that everybody has to come to the table knowing they're either going to get something or that they're not going to get it. In other words, it's okay for you to have five neighbors get together and four of them have an advantage, and the fifth can simply watch and say, oh, all of you are enjoying something cool and it's not hurting you. That's one of the things that occurred in Green Bay. When we got together, we knew we needed to expand our convention center. It was talked about since the mid-'80s. I became mayor in 1995 and immediately embarked on an effort to expand that convention center and to build a new arena. Our old Don County Memorial Arena seats about 5,000 or 6,000, I believe. We needed a 10,000-seat arena for a variety of activities, including the UW Green Bay Phoenix. And so we got six communities to the table, along with Brown County, who really didn't handle a dollar stake in the whole effort. And we got everybody to agree that dedicating your room tax dollars, and for two of us, 
that dedication was much larger than for everybody else. But dedicating your room tax dollars to a convention center was, is going to guarantee that your hotels are going to fill up faster. So if there's a, a much bigger convention in downtown Green Bay, the odds of, of a hotel in Bellevue uh, see more beds uh, filled was significantly enhanced. Very few of those people who came to the table saw value in the rest center being built, this fabulous new arena that we, that we opened in 2002. And so the, so the incentive was, let's get everybody to the table. We're going to build a $50 million arena and a $15 million convention center. And the value to everybody is for the smaller project, or from the smaller project. Six of us agreed on that. Everybody dedicated their room tax. There were two communities that benefited more than the others. Green Bay, of course, because we, we hosted the convention center, and Schwabenheim because and I, and, and they, they benefit solely from, from the fact that they can say that Fresh Center is in Schwabenheim as opposed to Green Bay, right across the street from Lambeau Field. But they don't get any tax dollars, they tax benefit from it. Um, so it was, a, it was a situation where everybody saw some benefit, and as I, I talked about earlier, they, everyone knew that two communities were going to get more than the other four, but they were rational enough to say, yeah, the fact that we get more heads and beds in our communities uh, is of value to us, so let's dedicate our room tax. And there was one community, by the way, that didn't have a hotel that came to us and said, can I sign on to the resolution, resolution because someday we might have a hotel, and I'm going to make sure that we give you our room tax too. So it was, uh, it was one of the more the, the best collaborative efforts that we saw in Green Bay. And today, uh, I think you're seeing the benefit for everybody. The Green Bay's already at a point where, where they're ready to, to go to phase three in the convention center expansion, where they're going to probably be adding uh, about 50% uh, to the square footage. And uh, as you all may have followed, the, the rest center is a, is a place that is in the first two years of business there, it hosted 15 of the top 50 billboard acts in the country. So you, you would never have been able to see Neil Diamond or Elton John or the Eagles uh, or folks like that. And, and in two years, we hosted all, all of those acts uh, and, and drew from around the state. So it was a very good deal. And I want to thank you all for, for listening and the great questions you gave me. Thanks very much.